Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, uh, so uh, welcome everyone to the uh, QLS Quantitative Life Sciences uh, Seminar Series. Um, uh, today's speaker is um, um, uh, Gordon uh, Berman. He's from uh, Emory University in Atlanta. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Physio uh, Biology. Uh, Emory, uh, uh, sorry, um, Gordon uh, did his uh, education at uh, several universities. He first obtained his bachelor's uh, degree in uh, physics and mathematics from University of Michigan. Uh, he went on to do his um, uh, master's um, uh, at uh, Cornell in uh, physics as well and modern applied mathematics. And then eventually he got his uh, doctoral degree in 2009, uh, also in physics and applied uh, mathematics uh, at Cornell. Um, he's uh, got several positions uh, with, uh, uh, right after that, he first was uh, a visiting research scientist at uh, Ashburn. Um, this is actually HHMI Janelia Research Campus. Is that uh, is that correct? Was, uh, that was yeah. I, I was really at Princeton all that time, and I sort of was also there, sort of uh, simultaneously with it. I see. I see. And he was also, like you mentioned, he was at Princeton as a, a research uh, associate research scholar. He has uh, several affiliations right now um, um, uh, in, with, with physics and neuroscience program, quantitative theory and methods, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, but I think his main uh, affiliation is the Department of Biology. So um, uh, welcome, uh, Gordon, and I look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Let me start by sharing my screen. All right, everybody seeing the correct correct side of the screen look good. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm also so one of the things is I'm coming from the traditions I come from I like having discussion during the talk so I have probably put more material here than uh, in the talk than we actually need I need to go through so if people want to interrupt me and ask questions and stuff I'm happy to go through stuff and to like to have as interactive a thing as possible. So I have the chat up here, or if you just wanna go and unmute yourself and ask a question, that's also fine by me. Uh, so I, as as uh, thank you again for the invitation. This is really, really great. Uh, it's unfortunate I'm not going to be able to enjoy Montreal, but oh well, I can't have it all. So uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the work that we've been doing in my group over the last few years, really trying to think about quantifying uh, behavior and how we can sort of relate that to underlying neuroscience and evolution and genetics. So, so in general, sort of is animals are capable of doing a remarkable variety of things. And at the end of the day, it's behavior that is the thing that is predominantly selected for by evolution. It's the thing, it's what allows animals to go and forage or to just create social interactions, or just frankly to survive and find the things they need to in the world. So, and what we'd like to be able to do in order to really get an understanding and trying to link behavior to other aspects, we'd like to be able, we need to be able to quantify it and to be able to put numbers on it to make testable hypotheses and theories and all the other sorts of stuff that we'd like to do. So, but the problem is whether you have an animal running through the wild or you have a fly sort of by himself in a dish over here or fish swimming together. Like what are actually the numbers we put on this thing and how do we start to build some sort of intuition and understanding? And the sort of, of numbers that we've gotten really good at over the last few years, I'm just showing a few examples, there's many more I'm not, is using kind of deep learning based tracking algorithms or similar other sorts of tracking algorithms to actually figure out, and by the way, can you guys see my, my cursor as I'm moving it around? Yes. Okay, good. So basically we've, we've gotten really good at tracking points uh, of like, what are the postures of an animal as a function of time, uh, even in really complicated collectives where we're trying to keep individuals of a hundred somewhat identical looking zebrafish uh, constant over time. But what we haven't been able to do in the same sort of way, and this is really the types of sort of thinking about behavior that I'm interested in, is thinking about how do you quantify not the sort of the state, the postural state of an animal, 
but these more sort of long time scale structures. So how do you actually go from these short time scale postural descriptions to these longer time scale things like, for example, sleep wake cycles or hunger and satiation or aging or parental care or social interactions or other things, which are themselves, they're not necessarily exhibited by one particular behavior or movement, but by collections or groups of behaviors and how we decide to go from one thing to another thing to another thing. And, and a lot of these types of desires are conflicting and in internal structures. Like for example, like what I, like the example I like giving is like, if you're in bed at night and are hungry, do you decide to get up, right? You have two internal states, one which is your sort of sleep wake cycle, another one is your, is your hunger cycle. And then you have to sort of behaviorally make decisions as to how those sort of pushes and pulls interact with each other. And what we don't have, like I'm saying this all in words, but how do we actually put that in numbers by either observing the behavior of an animal and then how do we try and make predictions as to what the underlying physiology of the animal that generated those sort of sequences of behaviors might look like. And this is sort of sort of the dream type of theory sort of that sort of I have in my head and that we kind of are building towards in my group. And the idea is sort of this notion, and we're gonna sort of get more into details and things about sort of how one might go about it, but this is kind of the sort of thing that sort of how I picture is that maybe you have some landscape of sets of behaviors that sort of the internal states of your brain might say, say this is like grooming your, say, say this is like scratching your ear or something like that. And there's other things like walking or running. And that there are certain sort of stereotype behaviors with some noise around them. And then you might sort of get kicked over to nearby things. And then as sort of your internal states, say sleep wake or hunger or other sorts of things might bias your, your performance of your behaviors by shifting this underlying landscape and then hopefully we could write this down in terms of some math and some understanding that it actually has some bearing on the real data. Now we're not there and I'm not gonna show you any model that actually looks like this, but this is kind of, I always like sort of showing the idea and the picture that I have in my head. And before I show you kind of whatever our crude approximation to what we're trying to do is. And, but despite that, so let's take a look to see sort of what the, sort of the landscape of sort of types of models that people use to describe behavioral patterns and sequences in these sort of structures. And I have four different examples here. All of all our papers I, I really enjoy actually, but they're representative that very few things in the literature really talk about sort of time scales more than like a few seconds, whether it's looking at sort of this, what we call a Markov model. So a model where you decide given that a Norway rat is going to groom one part of its body, what's the next part of its body it's going to groom? And you make that based just on what your current behavior is or maybe what the last couple of behaviors are. So there's no history. And similarly, these other types of models, you can get a little bit fancier by sort of adding a couple of little extra time scales on through these other sorts of methods. And I can go into some of the details later if people are curious. But the long story short of it is, is that if you sort of comb through the literature, very few, it's very hard to build that bridge between sort of the short time scale movements of the things that an animal does and sort of the long time scale structures of how does an animal go about its day and sort of satisfy all the needs that it needs to in order to survive and evolve and other sorts of things. Now, of course, I'm very far from the only person, first person to have thought about this. And this includes some very beautiful work in the classical ethology literature. Uh, here's a paper I, I really love from back in the 70s from Walter Heiligenberg. We're basically looking at these fish, sort of figured out sort of ways of writing something that would look at home in sort of the pages of nature neuroscience today using like a nice sort of dimensionality reduction approaches to try and find how do kind of these groups of behaviors sort of shift together as a function of time. However, the problem is he had to go and stare at these tanks of fish and then write down sort of physical annotations of behavior for hours and hours and hours and days and days. And even then we're not sure exactly when he writes down feeding or digging or attacking or courting, whether that's the right level of description or how we would then sort of describe it. Similarly, like 
you have like the beautiful work, probably one of the most influential pieces of work for me is Nico Tinbergen's uh, The Study of Instinct and the sort of notion of hierarchical structure and behavior where the same behavior can have different meanings depending on the context. Uh, and so even within the notion of say reproductive instinct, you could still say of the same action could be resulting in part of a fighting sequence or a building or a mating or care from offspring sequence. And you can build up long time scale structures, but there's not really that much math here. And it's hard to make predictions, particularly quantitative predictions if you don't have a mathematical or a theoretical framework or even really a measurement framework to decide what actually is boring or what is a zigzag dance uh, before you start. And so that's sort of where we try and pick up and trying to think about what we wanted. How do you do this? And how do we really try and understand long time scale structure and behavior? And so what there, there's, in my mind, there's sort of three steps you need to do in order to try and build this type of understanding and model. So to build this understanding of long time scale behavior, we need three things. First is a means of represent, and we're gonna go through bits and pieces of each of these three things during the talk today. But the first is that we need a means of representing short time scale behavior that allows us to do this moving between time scales. So what that means is we need to somehow go from these sort of postural tracks that I showed you very at the beginning of the talk and move to a way where we go from the postural tracks to some sort of a notion of behavior that we can then sort of serve as an atomistic base that we can build upon. And then from there, what we need to do is have to actually go from those atomistic bases and do what I call coarse and fine graining procedures that allow us to shift between those time scales. How do you go from individual movements like grooming the ear to a grooming sequence to looking at when you're going to groom in the context of other behaviors to look at when you're going how those sort of how that context changes as a function of age so how can you then what are sort of the frameworks we can build where we can move between those different types of structures and then lastly is that given we have a representation and given we have a way of moving between scales we'd like to be able to create some theory uh, to then create predictive models. And by predictive, I mean sort of A, what's like the future trajectory of that animal? What C, B, what would happen in future experiments? And C is sort of what would we predict about other modalities? So if we're looking at the behavior of an animal, what can we predict, say, about how transcription is going to change or how neural activity will change or how it's going to evolve? And so that, those are kind of the goals and the sort of the overall sort of hopes that we have. And I'm going to start off with sort of number one, which is sort of the stuff that largely started during my postdoctoral work, and we've been continuing on uh, more here uh, after starting at Emory. And again, please feel free to stop me when, if there's any questions at any point. So when I like when I start talking about representing behavior, I always like sort of talk starting to talk with this type of um, with almost a metaphor. If you have some, if there's some gene, some piece of DNA that we're interested in studying, right? Put, put, a, put a bunch of geneticists in a room. Like DNA is a really complicated molecule with structure at all sorts of different scales. Uh, you can do all sorts of interesting stuff to it. You can methylate it, it can bend around, it can be grouped in chromosomes or chronotin, all sorts of things. However, we sort of know that if we sequence it, come up with a series of A, G's, T's, and C's, or amino acid sequences, or if we have other things from ChipSeq or other types of data, we have now a low dimensional way of taking this complicated object and having a description of it, which may not say absolutely everything about it, but it says enough that we can start arguing. And that's, and that's sort of, so we can have that. Similarly, by sort of just by construction, a neuron is an even more complicated object than DNA, but we, we've learned that we can still gain a lot of insight by having a reduced sort of description of it by looking at say membrane voltages or even more simple by looking at when does this neuron spike or not. And although that doesn't tell us everything clearly and there's a lot of other interesting stuff going on, it gives us a nice low dimensional language mathematically to describe what it is, make predictive theories and all the stuff that we as scientists like to do and serve as the basis of our arguments. But if I were to show you this video of my dog and cat interacting, like what are the numbers that we put on that? How do we describe sort of these behaviors of the animals interacting with each other? Um, and how do we, that dog, by the way, is sitting on my feet right now. And, and so how do we actually, like, how would we describe that? And where would we even start? What would be the low dimensional language to describe that? And that's kind of our goal. What I'm gonna try and convince you of 
is a good way of sort of starting to talk about this, or at least having kind of, I don't want to quite say a base pair equivalent, because I think that's that is a, that's sort of a vast oversimplification. But what I'm going to claim is that a good way of thinking about this is stereotype behaviors. So the next slide or two, I'm going to really show the fact that I have a physics education by asking you to do something completely ridiculous and saying, this is the space of all possible postures. So this could be, say, like the angles of my arm as I move it around or something like that. And then if you were to look at the trajectories in the space of all possible postures I could make, there's gonna be some simple trajectories. And there might be some sort of periodic things. And there could be some crazier stuff as well. Or there could be some really crazy stuff which sort of fills up the whole possible space of postures. However, if you actually watch an animal behave, this isn't what you see. What you see is something that might look more like this where you have a bunch of behaviors which are performed often, maybe with a little bit of noise, uh, uh, and maybe every once in a while you get some weird stuff you don't see that often. But, and these sort of overall sorts of clustered structures would be called stereotype behaviors. Like one of, for, those, for those of you listening that are old enough, this is, this is sort of why the Ministry of Silly Walks from Monty Python is funny because of the fact there's all sorts of behaviors, all sorts of sets of motions that an animal could do, but we just typically don't see. And so the notion is we're going to take advantage of that structure and behavior to try and figure out what exactly, to try and have sort of this atomistic picture and description. And then the idea is maybe each time you go around the loop, you put a dot over there, or each time you do this, you put a dot there. And then we can sort of then look at the metadynamics to see how we transition between these these underlying uh, types of behavioral structures. And we're gonna try and build a mathematical framework that can do that. Yeah, okay, so I've, I've yammered on enough. Let's actually start talking some data and stuff that we actually get here. So what we have is, so just for the first bit of the talk, uh, the initial data set that we did a lot of this work is with these, just looking at a bunch of Drosophila and Melanogaster running around in an existentialist hell. So if there's an empty field, no stimulus, and there's a camera following it around everywhere. Uh, I, I've been told that I should probably call it a postmodernist hell, but somehow existentialist hell sounds funnier. So I'm sticking with that for now. And, and the notion is, is that what we're going to do is just we're going to watch this animal, film these uh, roughly 60 male flies, each image for an hour, and trying to see exactly sort of what are the types, types of structures and things that we see in the data. And can we build, can we isolate what those stereotype behaviors are? So I'm not gonna go into all of the details of the solution because this is a fairly old result by now, uh, but, I, but the general idea is we're trying to isolate what those stereotype behaviors are. So we start with images, then we do some alignment to make sure that if I do this behavior here, we're gonna call it the same as if I do the same behavior over here. Then we essentially look at um, the sort of the postural trajectories. So you could imagine we have a bunch of time series, which could be like the angles, the wing angles, or the leg angles, or the joint angles of various things. Then we sort of pret we pretend that it's like birdsong, and we're going to look at the spectral properties. So what frequency is, what part of the body is moving at what speeds, effectively. And then we we do that, and so this gives us this very over a thousand dimensional vector. And because I have a theoretical physics training, we're going to do something completely stupid and take that down from ten, roughly a thousand dimensions down to two and use that representation as, an, as a way to try and describe what each of the stereotype behaviors are. I'm gonna show you how this actually works in practice in a second, but I just wanted to sort of give this broad overview pipeline. We have some code in my grad, this is which is originally in MATLAB that does this, but my uh, grad student is also, I should put the link on there for future talks, is that my grad student also has just come up with a nice Python implementation of all of these things as well. So. I'm happy to chat with those, any of you afterwards, if you're curious about trying this stuff yourself. Um, and so we apply it to our fly data and we get this plot here. So first of all, this is a plot with about 22 million points on it, which is sort of fun. Uh, and so what we can do is one of the things you notice about this space is that it's clumpy, right? If you look, it's not kind of isotropically spread throughout everywhere. And in fact, if you convolve each of those points with a small Gaussian and get a probability density over this 2D space, you see a bunch of peaks and then a bunch of valleys. And so that's one interesting thing. 
So you have a bunch, of, we have this peaky landscape. And the second thing is each of these points is one point in time, right? So what we're doing is this is this weird abstracted space where points are put next to each other. Uh, points are put next to each other uh, if, they're, if the animal is moving similar parts of its body at similar speeds. Uh, there's a question in the chat about what the colors represent. Here, the colors represent sort of the overall activity level of the animal. Overall, so it's, it's basically the sum of those spectral properties. Let's let's ignore that for the moment. I put, I leave them on here just because it makes it a little bit easier to look at. Um, and for originally we made this for the reviewers because we actually get rid of some of that information and we wanted to show them it didn't really matter. But so the point here is that we have each of these points or points in time, and what we can then do is watch to see how does the how does it move in this weird abstracted space as the animal moves through. And turns out we get a kind of cool thing that, so we get a lot of trajectories that look like this, sort of, sort of stay one place for a while, then switch quickly, sit in one place, move quickly. So sort of sit for a while. It almost, it, almost, it almost looks like one of those experiments where you have like beads and an optical tweezer on DNA or something. So we have this little sit for a while, then move, sit for a while, then move. And we can quantify this by, this is a, a distribution of the speed. Notice how this is on a log scale and we get this sort of beautiful bi log normal distribution where you have for a long time, it'll sort of sit really for a while at one place and move quickly, sit one place and move quickly and so on. And so we combine those two things together where we have this peaky landscape where it sits, where it'll sit at a peak then move to a different peak, sit at a peak, move to a different peak, sit at a peak, move to a different peak. And so we can ask ourselves, so what happens then when you sit at one of these peaks for a while, what is, what's happening in the behavior? So for example, if you take this peak over here and I'm gonna randomly pull out uh, sequences of where the fly is mapped to that peak and is staying there for a while. And turns out the flies there are always running at the same speed. Great. We can then go over here. Up here, the flies are grooming their head with a slight left asymmetry if you look really carefully. Or down here, the flies are grooming their left wing. And so we call this over our structure, the behave, our, our behavioral space, because each one of these peaks corresponds to a different uh, stereotype behavior that the animal uh, exhibits. And because one of my group's specialties is making gratuitous movies, here's a gratuitous movie. So what you'll see is that we have or the flies position in the dish here on the left, we have the fly here, and then we have it moving through the behavioral space on the right. And when it's, this is cyan, this is meaning that the, it's sort of paused. It's in that left peak distribution of that speed, that left peak of the speed distribution. And so run at real time initially, then it's gonna slow down. You can really see it sort of, it sits at peaks, then it moves around. It moves to different sets of things depending on how it works. And so we get this type of representation. And then what, what we're going to be looking at as we move through this talk is then how do you move through the space and how do you model how this animal sort of is going to move from behavior to behavior to behavior over the course of this. And we've done a lot of stuff with this. I'm not going to have a chance to, to talk about all sort of the different sort of notions we've been able to build upon this representation from looking at circadian rhythms, you know, flies wake up, go to sleep. So on, or aging. Uh, one result that we should hopefully be posting on archive soon is that we find that the the male flies have a uh, have a midlife crisis and the females don't. For those of you who are interested and curious, uh, looking at social interactions, I might get into a little bit of evolution of behavior at the end, depending on how much time we have, and then also looking to see how sort of different behaviors are coordinated together. Um, and sort of, and this isn't just sort of stuff in flies that we've been doing. So we've been working on stuff, either looking at with simultaneous neural recording in, uh, in rats. Uh, there's been work for it with uh, Rosbeck O's lab, looking at mice as well that aren't shown here, uh, prairie voles, and we, rats, and then uh, also, even also looking at human uh, gait, uh, human gait impairment dur uh, in, during stroke rehabilitation. And we've been able to kind of build a bunch of representations and models based off of that, including trying to understand, for example, how like over here, we can see sort of trajectories through this low dimensional space that emerge uh, 
in able-bodied individuals versus uh, recent stroke patients. And so try, and trying to understand sort of how we can compress these sort of orbits down into sort of more stable loops. So this is sort of the types of overall stuff we can do, but I wanna show a particular example uh, that I think sort of shows the power and sort of the type of stuff we can do. And I'm happy to talk about sort of this other things we can do either in questions afterwards or in chatting with students uh, after the talk. And so what I wanna focus on is something which is in common with almost all animals, which is they have a neck, whether it be the giraffe beetle or a giraffe or us, is that we have a lot of neurons in our brain we have a lot of stuff we can do. And then there's a relatively small number of neurons in between uh, the brain and the rest of the body, which can sort of control, which sort of carry those commands of what you wanna do behaviorally from the brain out to all the things that are actually doing the movement. So in the fly, there's about 300 pairs-ish of what's called descending neurons. These are neurons that have their cell bodies in the brain. They have axons that travel down through the fly's ventral nerve cord for the non-invertebrate anatomists, which is sort of roughly analogous to uh, to sort of the vertebrate spinal cord, you know, I, as I recognize, there's probably a bunch of shutters as I say that, but that's uh, but that's sort of how maybe to think about it for the per for the purposes of a theoretical physicist, it's close enough. Uh, and so the idea is maybe we can think about this channel is a way of probing how the brain might control behavior and really try and because we have this bottleneck a literal information bottleneck from the brain to the rest of the body, can we study this a little bit? So this is where my great collaborators at Genalia uh, came in. And so they made a bunch of fly lines where you can optogenetically target individual neurons that are in this, of this group, which have their cell bodies up in the brain and then have, a neuro, then have an axon traveling down through the ventral nerve cord in the fly. And because they're flies and their cuticles are translucent to red light, when you shine a red LED, if you, and you can express this uh, channel redoxin and only this one neuron, you can then excite a neuron, no surgery, just complicated genetics. And so we can then take a freely behaving animal and then study its behavior uh, once stimulated. And then we can see sort of tiled together, how do these different neurons uh, actuate different behaviors? So we have a setup where we can sort of have this red light go on or off a bunch of times. And then we can essentially measure Okay, in this case, let's stimulate this sort of set of neurons in here. And then this is a behavioral space where I've taken a bunch of trials and aligned them to, to and the light's gonna come on at T equals zero. So at T equals zero, the lights come on, see everything comes up here. It's gonna be on for 15 seconds. And at 15 seconds, the light comes off and everything sort of goes back to normal. What we had to do is we had to develop some statistical methods to actually figure out which, which regions are being upregulated and downregulated, which is harder than what it might initially seem just because the multiple hypothesis correction aspect of this is uh, really eats, eats you alive really quickly unless you're careful. Uh, but, we had to, but we eventually figured out a way that made us happy with it. And so what you can show is that this region gets upregulated. It's consistent over time. So every, this is, this is one individual and you can see that the sort of the density in that region is very consistently activated each time we turn on the red light. And here is a region which is negative, which turns out is idle. So the animal is not doing nothing when you turn on the light. And we can see in the experimental flies in a second, the red light will turn on and you'll see they're grooming their head uncontrollably. So we can isolate the sort of the sets of behaviors that get actuated when you turn on the light based off of this approach without having to say, hmm, I wonder if they groom their head when you hit this neuron. So you can sort of do this almost as forward, this forward behavioral screen where we're looking at a bunch of different possible behaviors and then trying to isolate what are the actual effects of a particular manipulation. We get. And we can do this across a variety of different lines. So each of this, each of these sort of red regions represents a different set of neurons. And then we can, we have a bunch of results trying to tile together how all of these things are functioning together. All right, so that's what I want to talk about representation. I guess now I'll, maybe I'll, I'll take a quick beat and let, are there any questions that people have? I, I kind of have a question. So, so uh, we're talking about, uh, um, I mean, obviously uh, maybe you're just showing us a, uh, 
uh, a subset of the experiments that uh, that were conducted on the uh, on the on flies. But uh, it seems to me that these are constrained experiments. So the higher the level of the species, and the more complicated their movements are, perhaps. Uh, and uh, and I would make it a little bit more philosophical by saying the more uh, the the more free will you have, wouldn't be wouldn't this problem become extremely complicated? Or am I missing something? I mean, it I mean, it depends. I mean, so there's there's a combination of practicalities and and yeah, in philosophy to a certain extent. Here, I would say the flies are kind of a they're kind of a good. First of all, they were a great in species to have developed a lot of these approaches on, partially because they're uh, we can get a lot of data, and so we can work in this regime where we have essentially an infinite amount of perfect data. And then we can worry about, without having to worry about the practicalities of, okay, we, we have a finite data size, how can we work with this stuff? And then also their behaviors are probably a little bit more stereotyped than other animals. And that allows us to kind of say, isolate those stereotypes a little bit better. We can later show as you actually get similar sorts of things looking at rodents and even at human behavior. Um, but again, yeah, I mean, it's always going to be a question. And I think really where the differences are gonna come are less from the postural movements, but more on sort of how you build those postural movements on top of each other. As, as again, I'll go back to Monty Python's Ministry of Silly Walks. Like we actually do have pretty stereotyped sets of movements that we make. If you could probably watch me giving several talks and my hand gestures, and they're probably going to be very sort of a very small set of overall possible hand gestures that I could be making. So I think that general idea holds true, but there's going to be some practicalities in how you actually measure the time scales and the length scales and all sorts of other things. But yeah, we'll we'll talk a little bit more about sort of sort of comparative approaches, and certainly that's something we're thinking a lot about. Okay, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. So the second part I want to talk about, so we have this representation and then how can we build, in particular, we're going to look at coarse graining operations. So how can we go from these quote unquote atomistic sort of parts of behavior and then how can we try and build longer time scale representations that can pick up what's happening? And again, this is very much inspired by this work from ethology where you can have individual behaviors here, even within chasing, say for example, there's probably subsections of chasing in terms of turning left, turning right. Uh, stopping, uh, but how can you build up and build more and more complicated notions of behavior? And so let's go back to the space for the flies. And we're, we're gonna still work with this data for a little while here, but I'm gonna show you this is a somewhat general phenomenon, but it's just, we have more data and I spent more time staring at this particular data set. So we have this data of all these flies in the space. And what we can do is we can say, how do you move from peak to peak to peak? And if you do that, one way of representing that is with this Markov transition matrix, which I represented as lines here between the peaks, where the curvature of the line represents the direction. Uh, it's right, and it's right-handed. So, for example, this one is from here to here. This one is from here to here. And the thickness represents sort of the probability of given that I'm at this, uh, given that I'm at this behavior, where's the next behavior I'm going to? And the first thing that should pop out to you here is that it's not a hairball. Most of the behaviors the animal is performing to or is transitioning to are sort of nearby in the space. And so in general, I think there's actually a fairly boring explanation for that, which is that postural facilitation, basically meaning if you're gonna go from grooming my head to grooming my wings, I've gotta go through behaviors in between, otherwise I'm gonna fall flat on my face. So there's sort of a boring explanation for that, but. But, uh, but given that you're performing similar behaviors, you tend to transition your body. So that's just sort of what it looks like. We can make that a more quantitative statement by, uh, by actually looking through it. If we were, to, I took off the slide, unfortunately, but if we were actually to go and quantify through this, you would see that, for example, uh, and quantify this transition matrix here, you would see that, for example, you have a bunch of idle behaviors here that all transition to each other, or you have a bunch of locomot uh, posterior behaviors or locomotion behaviors and so on. But the question I wanna ask, and sort of I know what the answer is before I start, but you don't know how bad, like, you don't know how bad the, uh, the result is, is can these transitions remember? Like, is there even any long time 
long time scale structure in here whatsoever. Like, can I just tell you what the animal is going to be doing next based on what it's currently doing? And so how can we ask this? So we can take this matrix here. So saying the initial state of the animal and the final state, and we can actually ask this by multiplying this matrix by itself a bunch of times. So if we were to multiply this matrix by itself a hundred times, say for example, that would say, what's the transition matrix between the behavior I'm doing now and the behavior I'm doing a hundred time steps from now. And if you were to do that, just doing that multiplication, assuming that history doesn't matter, you get a matrix that looks like this with all these vertical lines. And what a vertical line means here is that my initial state doesn't matter. Essentially, I've forgotten almost everything. And I'm just going to transition to the same probability distribution of states 100 time steps from now, regardless of where I started. There's a little bit of some changes up here, but for the most part, there's not much structure. But if you actually look at the data, right? Because we can actually compute that joint probability distribution of given what I'm doing now, what am I do? What am I doing 100 time steps from now, given what I'm doing now? And there actually is quite a lot of structure there. Similarly, even looking at a thousand time steps into the future, you're, it's gotten a little bit more random. It looks a little bit more vertical, but you can still see there's a lot of interesting structure that still exists. It's not just a bunch of vertical lines. We can quantify that notion just by looking at the eigenvalues of this matrix and using something called the Perron Frobenius theorem, uh, which essentially says that these eigenvalues are going to correspond tightly to the time scales of how long information decays. And well, I've plotted this again on a log scale in terms of number of transitions. These dashed lines are what you would expect with a Markov model, including all of the finite data size corrections and things that one needs to do to be, uh, to be precise. And so this is looking at the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth eigenvalues of this matrix. And what you see is that they're all decaying off two orders of magnitude, at least slower than what you saw from this Markov model. And so not only is sort of this picture, this historyless picture, Sort of not a good model, it's, it's a bad model by two orders of magnitude in terms of its structure. And so all of these models that have like autoregressive hidden Markov models, hidden Markov models, stuff like that, they basically can't capture this type of structure. And you can show this pretty, we had a preprint that I've been part of that just recently came out, which shows that in fact, to get this type of structure that we see, we would need to basically have a Markov model that remembers an, almost an infinite number of states back behind it. So that tells us that we really need to have some sort of a dynamical picture to see what's going on. And we're gonna to get to that towards the very end of this. Um, but what I wanna say first is that this is a pretty non, this is a pretty, despite the fact that it's really hard to write down a model that does this, almost all data sets we looked at have the same structure. So here's looking at aging fruit flies of different ages for both male and female flies. You see the same sort of thing. A recent paper that we just uh, published in collaboration with Ben Silvesky's group at Harvard showed similar things looking at rat data, um, where you get the similar types of uh, couple orders of magnitude uh, changes, or even looking at human ECOG data from some of the epilepsy patients that we have uh, that, that, are, that have uh, ECOG electrodes implanted to help them uh, diagnose epilepsy. We see the same set of, and just run the same analysis on those time series, uh, we get the same set of uh, uh, long time scale structure showing, but now we get even like a five order of magnitude change. So the, the effect becomes even larger. This is actually, I should note, was work from Yuting Yang, who is a former undergrad in the group and is now, now a Cornell for, uh, for her PhD. So can, what, how can we say that? And how can we use this sort of measurement of long time scale structure to say something about um, to say, to say something about how we might be able to group these behaviors together and course screen out to understand stuff at different type, different time scales. And how we're gonna try and do that is right now, just literally do what I just said, try and group the behaviors together. And so what that really means is we're gonna cluster the behavior space. So let's say I have order hundred peaks, which is about right in a space. And what I'm gonna try and do is gonna put them in some number of groups. So I'm gonna call them cluster one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or however many I decide. And what I'm gonna do, but I'm gonna do this in a very special way. I'm gonna use something called the information bottleneck to optimally predict the future sort of state of the, of the animal, uh, but with as simple of a clustering as possible. So we're gonna predict the future by computing the mutual information. And for those of you who 
aren't familiar with mutual information is just to think of this as a nonlinear correlation measure that captures more than you could get from a typical type of uh, Pearson's correlation or something like that. And basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to op trying to maximize the information between my clustering of the space and what the state is sometime tau in the future. But I also want to make it as simple as possible, right? Because obviously the best way I can do this is just to keep the whole space by itself with each peak being its own thing. But I'm then also going to then put a constraint where I'm going to penalize to have a more and more complicated uh, representation. So basically by having more and more information in, in my clustering. And I can vary sort of how much I care about beta. I can vary how far in the future I'm looking and I can also sort of vary the number of clusters I see. And if I do that, I get a bunch of curves that look like this. So this is my ability to predict the future and this is my simplicity of the representation. So you wanna sort of be up, up and to the left here. You want to have a lot of information, but you also want to be as simple as possible. So you want to sort of a better curve is sort of here. Then each of these curves is looking at a different time step. So this is at tau equals one, two, and then this is down, I think, like 5,000 or something. And first of all, comfortingly, these curves are decreasing, right? So the further out into the future that I'm looking, the less information about the future I have. But also what you can see is that you get this sort of structure where it's sort of, we can move along these curves where I go from simpler to more complicated representations uh, that predict more to simpler representations that predict less. And I can pick it as a particular time. And note also how that it never quite goes down to zero. So even if I'm looking really far out into the future, which 5,000 time steps here, which you can think about as maybe 20 minutes uh, or 10, something somewhere between 10 to 20 minutes, you can then you still get a surprise. You still get some information about what the animal is going to be doing. Let's take a look, say at tau equals 100, and sort of move along this curve to see what the structure looks like. If we do that, moving along this curve, as we start here, we start with one cluster, which is of course the whole thing. Two is like this. Three, so which is sort of idle and slow versus everything else. Then locomotion breaks off. Then you get anterior, posterior. Then some abdomeny things and so on and so forth. And the space sort of keeps on breaking down hierarchically. So there's someone that read a bunch of Tinberg and this is very exciting when I first saw this, that we get this hierarchical structure within the behavioral space. And we can see this in perhaps a prettier plot as if you sort of see where does all of the sort of the density within each of these regions go as you go from one, re from one clustering, from one cluster to two to three and so on. You can see you really get this tree-like structure until you get sort of towards the end and uh, you re start running out of data to really make predictions. So we get this sort of hierarchical structure that is best representing the long time scale dynamics and behavior. And so that we sort of have to take that notion as you move forward. And so we can use the type of predictive structure as we can move between say these different curves. Say if I wanna say at this, let's say I'm going to pick say 1.5 bits of information here, I can move along and I would have a more complicated representation, um, or let's say I want to predict the same amount moving on a horizontal, I would have a more complicated representation for that in order to get for at um, that same amount of information at longer times and a, in a, in a uh, simpler representation at shorter times, or if I'm going to constrain the amount of uh, sort of say where this thing is plateauing, what I would see is this plateau is sort of moving uh, further and further to the right, or sorry, further and further to the left the, uh, as I go further and further up in time. So essentially you get a coarsening of the space with time. And so one of the things, so one of the interesting things that this predicts is that you're gonna get a context dependency in the control that sort of what you wanna do is say, if I'm going to actuate a particular behavior, that behavior's effect is, going to be determined on sort of how I'm going to, what's the overall context of that action. So thus, if I have a constraint, like say an information bottleneck, I might want to multiplex down that channel so that hitting the same neuron could actuate different behaviors depending on the context. And sure enough, when we do this in the fly, we see this. And so what we see, so let's take this pair of neurons here. And we actually get that there's two significant regions here for this particular neuron. I should note this is some calculations done by Jiri Ku, uh, Q, who is a former uh, 
uh, grad student in my group. And what you can see is you get this big yellow region here, which is sort of like vague sort of twitches of the front legs. And then you get this region here. And what I'm plotting underneath them are, are conditional probability density. So what was the fly doing immediately before uh, you turned on the red light? And what you can see is that over here, you get a pretty broad distribution across all of the space. Whereas if you go to this one, for the most part, the fly were almost always sort of in this state here with a few over here as well. And if you look to see exactly what this, what this behavior is, is it's a sort of a wing waggle. And so basically if the fly is doing something with its wings, it's this different set of courtship dynamics that uh, like dynamics that wind up emerging if you stimulate this particular neuron. And so we get this context dependency in that particular example, and we can then show that for almost all of the neurons that we looked at, so each one of these, each one of these dots is a different fly line with has different neurons excited. And this is the this is basically how much information do I have about what behavior I'm going to do given the, what the animal was previously doing. So this is this is what the controls were. This was the experimental. And this is zero. And so if you're sort of in this wedge of space that means you have a significant, uh, you're, you have a significant context, context dependency. And we found that about 85% of the lines we study have this context dependency in it. So we really are seeing this notion of hierarchical control that has this neurological implications that is making this prediction of how we would expect the system is organized. And we're working on a couple of theory papers really trying to uh, iron that out a little bit more uh, thoroughly right now. So this is what we have sort of our thinking about coarse graining structures and fine graining structures uh, in, um, in behavior. What I wanna talk about at the end is sort of a hodgepodge of sort of different things where we've been talking about uh, as far as building sort of this theoretical infrastructure. So the first thing we've been playing with, and so this is a recent preprint uh, that came out last year and hopefully we're about ready to submit for revisions, uh, thinking about fly evolution. So this is really the work of Damian Hernandez and uh, Catalina Rivera uh, in collaboration with David Stern and Jessica Candy. And so what we did is we took about 600 flies uh, from six species and measured what their behaviors look like, uh, a bunch of different strains to make sure we got some, some variation. What we were trying to do is think about what are the behaviors that are evolving together and how can we isolate behavioral variability from individual variability across all of these animals? And maybe this notion of, kind of trying to build long and short time scale structure might actually tell us something. And so, first of all, if we actually take all of the behavioral maps for each individual and then sort of do a uh, sort of do a double dimensionality reduction. So we did a dimensionality reduction to get those maps. But then we're going to sort of put all of have a distance metric between each of those maps to see how similar they are and then do a dimensionality reduction on that. And what you can see, is, and these are colored by species with the, with the shape being the strain type. And what you can see is that there's, there's a lot of structure here, is that it's not just completely random. So there, there does look like there's some species specific information. And again, we can quantify that by just doing a very, this isn't even a complicated neural network or anything like that, just doing a, a logistic regression confusion matrix uh, and that we can see, and this is training, and this is test set accuracy. So this is on data that the that the regression hadn't seen previously. You get that it's we're getting over ninety percent accuracy on average across all of the animals. And so we can there is information about which species it is based off of just the behavioral maps we're seeing. And so then maybe what we can then do is use this as a way of, of phenotyping and seeing how behaviors are evolving together. Oh. And so what Dami and Catalina came up with was a model where essentially we do a random walk on the space of behaviors. So where, where we have two matrices, one is an individual covariance matrix, which is I'm going to have some amount of variability of behaviors, sort of intraspecies. Then you have an interspecies covariance matrix, which is going to talk about how behaviors are varying sort of along the tree as you move along. And we're looking again at these six species here. And if we look at this individual covariance matrix, something really surprising came, which was, first of all, we, we got that this really sort of nice modular structure, which reminded us a lot of that sort of 
that coarse graining hierarchy that I just showed you. And it turns out we could do that exact same calculation with these flies. And quantitatively, we get very good agreement between these information bottleneck coarse grain derived clusters and this individual covariance matrix, despite the fact that these were derived in completely different ways. And again, I'm not showing the quantifications of this, but we can show that this are, these are way more similar than you would ever expect by chance. And so the idea then is that really what's happening is these long time scale structures and behavior, really what they're explaining is they're explaining a lot of the individual variants that we're seeing and how behaviors are individuals are performing given behaviors. So essentially that because we're only watching the animal behave for say an hour and they're, they have these longer time scale behaviors, really we're, we're seeing many different individuals within that species and their mood is almost the same as watching individuals at, across the longer time scale. And then we can then look at the phylogenetic covariance matrix. We get a much more complicated set of structures of things that are grouped together. And the idea is these can be behaviors that might be evolving together. And this is giving us some predictions as to if we were to then genotype all of these species, which we're currently working on a project to do this across way more than six species. If we were to then to genotype and actually do our, everyone's favorite sort of looking for the lo loci of genetic evolution types of analyses, we're predicting sort of sub uh, sort of linear combinations of behavior, which might prove as better traits to describe behavioral evolution, which connects to a bunch of things about looking at bottleneck genes and other stuff that people have seen in morphological evolution. And the last thing I'm going to really talk about today, um, and this will just be a couple minutes and then I'll uh, let you guys uh, ask questions and things, is getting back to this notion at the beginning of having this actual dynamic picture for behavior. And can we actually, what might this thing look like and how might we build it? So the problem is that we actually sat down and tried to do math and actually tried to analytic, tried to just build something that we could fit to our data very, that looked simple. And it turned out we just weren't able to do that either because we weren't smart enough or just, it's not a, it wasn't a well-formed problem at the time. So what we decided to do is go the other route, way over parameterize the system and try and make it simpler. And so what we did, and so this is work from Itai Pinkovieski and Catherine Overman, a postdoc and grad student in the group. It, basically, they trained a recurrent neural network, which is basically trying to predict long time scale structures and sort of the sequence of states that I was talking about earlier. It's able to actually reproduce these types of things. And so this is, so this here is the dashed lines is, uh, is what this network does. And then this is what the, uh, the actual data are. And you can see we actually can get these models where we have these long time scale structures that we weren't seeing in sort of simpler types of Markov models and other things. And we can also re replicate things like the sort of coarse graining from the bottleneck analysis and everything. And I won't go into the details, but the general thing is because we now have a dynamical system, we can do stuff like look for the dynamical fixed points of this network and build sort of coarse grain representations and see how this network is shifting with time to see where these statistical non-stationarities and dynamical features are coming from. And moreover, the work of Kanish Jain, who is a uh, grad student also in my group, has been then trying to build, how do you then use that type of time scale structure to then build different types of representations at different scales that sort of more explicitly build in these ideas. But more is coming with that. Uh, but sort of, again, this is the overall picture and sort of the things that we're trying to go uh, move to going forward. And with that, really, I will, I will stop there. And I will just want to thank the people that are doing the work, the great members of the lab when we were still, you know, able to actually see each other. Uh, the problem of being a theory group is that we, we don't actually ever like intersect in the lab anymore. Um, and all the great collaborators uh, that we're working with on a variety of projects, the people that are giving us money. And also just as a quick plug, we're definitely recruiting grad students and postdocs right now. So curious or know anybody know of anybody please uh, feel free to send me a message thanks thanks very much Gordon uh, we'll uh, take some questions now if anybody would like to ask questions um, okay maybe while we wait um, I could can I ask you my a couple of questions myself <laughs> yeah, sure, of course uh, so so um, you have a lot actually but uh, let's focus on only two uh, the first one is, when I look at these heat maps, 
uh, that you've generated this space where all of these different uh, postures that you that you highlighted in your in your slides. Um, have you actually applied maybe optical flow? Uh, you know, you mentioned in your talk the importance of simplifying this problem as much as possible. You're a biophysicist, I'm a mathematician, and we, we both understand the importance of simplification. So the optical flow at least would give you an, a, a chance to define the topology of this of this uh, the, that underlies the dynamics of this of the system. So, so do you mean the optical flow in which space of like the in, optical in, flow in in the in the behavioral space space or exactly, in the original like, space. Image? Ah, so I will. So we I actually thought of this. The problem is, it's actually it's not. If you average across time, there's there usually winds up not being much optic flow in the space, and so and you can let me go back to the. What do you mean maybe, average over time? I mean, so first of all, like the, the point only exists at one point. Like you do, I guess you could look at this in terms of like if I were to look at a time series, like for example, this circadian aging thing, one could do an optic flow. And I think that might be an interesting analysis there. We did something slightly different, but that could be another option. Um, Optic, because of the nature of how things move, how you sort of stay in one spot, then move quickly, stay in one spot, move quickly. You have to then pick a time scale dynamic. And the fact that we get these nice sort of sit, switch, sit, switch, sit, switch dynamics almost left us to the point where it allowed us the ability to move to discrete a discrete representation. And that discrete representation for me was easier than the optic flow. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That to me, that was an even bigger simplification. It made my life even easier. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I don't. I want to give uh, other people a chance. So uh, we'll go to the questions. Um, could you please uh, say it instead of me reading it? Or <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, sorry. I, I just. I'm. Uh, thank you for the great talk. It was really great. It was really interesting. Oh, and um, I. I am very excited about how what are these perspectives this could have for evolutionary biology, and I wanted to know what do you think are the most um, like most interesting repercussions that this could can have for the field, as people try and dis and understand better evolutionary relationships of different clades. Yeah, I mean those are great questions. Those are things that I'm obviously very excited about. Um, I think there there are sort of there are two there are two ways I think that we're trying, at least the, I can say that we're trying to look at this towards sort of evolutionary biological questions. One is that just look, you, we now have a, a more rich phenotyping. And so maybe because we have more phenotypes to look at, maybe each of those individual phenotypes, uh, we can, we, and because we're looking at this sort of in a forward way, we don't have to sort of have a focus trait approach. So we can look across a variety of different traits and look at a bunch of them all at once. The other I think is more, slightly more subtle is it allows us to connect up to sort of the work that people have done in morphological evolution. So I'm most familiar with the stuff of flies, so you'll have to forgive me on that. But in flies, there's all this beautiful work from my collaborator, David Stern and others, thinking about um, basically how you get these small like single nucleotide mutations in these bottleneck genes which control a bunch of which are upstream of a bunch of different patterning genes can lead to wide scale sort of evolution between nearby species and if you were to just phenotype individual phenotypes on the animal you actually probably would miss a lot of the things and really where you get is you get a bunch of the phenotypes that are evolving together and so the hope is because you can measure a bunch of these things quantitatively and simultaneously the hope is that we can use sort of leverage and find sort of correlated traits, which are really the thing which evolution is acting on rather than like one behavior or a different behavior. So that's sort of from a methodological approach, uh, how, we're, how we're viewing things. Um, but again, we haven't actually shown anything that we've just sort of, we have a, this preprint out, which is more, which is definitely much more of a methods paper than something where we actually showed something more precise about the actual evolve, uh, evolution of flies. Yeah, it sounds like you're adding in like a, a new dimension to it, basically. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that sort of is the goal. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah. Again, we're, it's, it's definitely a direction we're exploring. Yeah, sounds, sounds great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.
Uh, Dr. Carter, sorry, you're mute. Sorry, I think you're, you're muted, sorry. Uh, okay, so anybody else uh, have questions? Um, okay, maybe they'll have more questions uh, during the session when you sit down with the students and uh, talk more a little bit uh, about their, about your work. So uh, let, uh, once again, uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Berman for, for a very interesting talk. And uh, uh, it's definitely a fascinating topic for sure. <laughs> Thanks for the Thank invite. you very much, Dr. Berman. Okay, take care, bye. So all the students, uh, we're gonna stay on the same Zoom and we will uh, talk to Dr. Berman now about the uh, papers we read for the Journal Club last week or any other questions you may have from the presentation. Um, Bianca and Jonas, is Jonas here? I'm here. Hey Jonas, hey. so we will be, Bianca and Jonas will be uh, kind of taking the lead here if uh, the rest of you don't mind, so. Uh, Bianca, maybe Jonas? if you maybe maybe if you could turn the recording off for this part oh of yeah it, sorry, so that sorry, we, sorry so that, yeah. that way we could have a little bit more of a candid conversation